Hey, everybody. This is Matthew Majinskis. Uh, I host the Crypto Voices podcast based in Latvia, uh, sending you this recording uh, with regrets. Definitely wish I was there with you in Vietnam. Hope you're having a great time. Uh, but I will say, I think uh, regardless, a lot of the cancellations probably allow for even more time for a direct economic pontification from Eric himself. So uh, you're welcome. All right, let me uh, just get right into it then. Grab the pointer. Uh, you're probably not going to see me too much, which is probably even better for the rest of this presentation. I only have 30 minutes, I'm told. Let's see how I can do. Let's talk about Bitcoin and base money and how to measure it. Uh, let's Before we start, let's, let's do a little quote here. This is from Walter Badgett. Uh, he was the third editor of The Economist uh, magazine slash newspaper, very famous in the UK. Badgett believed that money was gold and silver and that alone. All forms of currency, including the notes of the Bank of England, were credit instruments. The emphasis is mine there. No different than personal checks, from which it followed that the government had no business intervening in the business of banking. So money was gold and silver, and that alone, all forms of currency, including the notes of the Bank of England, were credit instruments no different than personal checks. Jim Grant actually wrote this recently. Uh, he's the editor of the famous uh, uh, Grant's Interest Rate Observer. Uh, but the person that he was sort of quoting who thought about Badgett's thoughts was George Norman. Who, who he was, it was his perspective of what Badgett was doing. George Norman was a uh, director of the Bank of England. Interestingly, he was also the grandfather of Montague Norman, who was a famous governor during the Depression times, interwar periods, uh, you know, uh, 70 years later in, uh, in the UK. And they were all talking about Walter Badgett here. Badgett was a famous banker, financial, you know, uh, pontificator, uh, an editor, of course, of The Economist. And, you know, for a long time, the point is that obviously there's a lot of people that uh, I think understand this opinion. Some people even butt heads with this opinion, but this was Badgett's opinion. Many people have had this opinion. Uh, it even has held through different legal precedents, so on and so forth. Um, but basically, I'm just going to show you that this is this is the way that basic money should be understood uh, today uh, as well. So here's the premise again uh, and how it relates to Bitcoin. The only comparable money supply with 21 million Bitcoins is the monetary base or base money. There have been different basic money supplies across uh, different eras, but there has always been a, a monetary base. So that's what we're going to talk about. Questions I'm going to cover. Uh, what is the economic concept of base money? Again, it goes by many names, base money, reserve money, monetary base, central bank money. What is the economic concept? Number two, how can we make economic comparisons across other base money, primarily gold and silver? Uh, let's explore money growth as well here. So this is both classical inflation, which means literally the growth of the money stock. And uh, let's explore this uh, concept of stock to flow, which is uh, very well known in sort of the hard money economist uh, community, uh, I think most famously brought to Bitcoin by Safedine Amos and uh, Plan B with his uh, stock to flow model. So I'll make some comments on that about where I think stock to flow fits in here. And then number three, uh, where does Bitcoin itself, of course, fit into this puzzle of basic money uh, in the world? All right, so let's talk about today. Today in 2020, basic money uh, uh, is two things. It's physical money and it's digital money. Okay, the physical money is what you know and love, uh, euros, dollars, yen, yuan, uh, Vietnamese dong in your pockets right now, uh, physical notes and coin in circulation. And the other portion is uh, commercial bank reserves at the central bank. So this is digital money or ledger money. Um, don't worry too much about this for this presentation. But basically, it suffices to say every bank, imagine that every bank in the world has an account with their respective central bank. That's called the reserve account. It's called the master account. That is basically where banks settle. So at the end of the day, they settle in basic money. There is no uh, more deducible asset of settlement. It is just basic money. So you can either settle in cash or you can settle in commercial bank reserves. Literally all of, you know, just imagine how hierarchical this really is. Uh, and of course it doesn't like happen every payment, every second, uh, you know, settling at the end of every day, but you can just imagine banks settling at the end of the day with their respective central bank that's called the reserve account. So this is what base money is. It's how you settle. Uh, and the split is 35-65 physical to digital uh, today. This is uh, how the curve looks over time. 
Right? Notice how I say here is a breakdown of the fiat printing press. So again, just to make it clear, when anybody talks about printing money, quantitative easing, uh, settlement media, that is can only be referring to the monetary base, which is a liability on the central bank's balance sheet. All right, we've compiled the top 30 floating currencies in the world. So here's physical currency and here's digital currency or the reserve account. And you notice, obviously, since 9-11, since dot-com, boom and bust, specifically from the financial crisis in 2008, uh, the reserve portion has exploded. Uh, you know, it used to be 80-20 split. Now it's 35-65 it's split. Reserves, definitely front and center. And, you know, any time you're talking about settling with banks, again, the master account, that's, that's done here. This is the reserve account. Monetary policy, um, you know. Uh, manipulating the money supply, the repo, the repo market. That's re repo market is basically how banks settle among themselves uh, at the central bank with repos. And and I'm even not interested in like the short term effects there. I'm just interested in how it looks over time and generally. So to get us a picture of where you know how this this puzzle fits together, as I mentioned, it's the fiat printing press. This is how it looks today. This literally is the printing press, All right? And uh, by the way, I guess I should say. Twenty trillion dollar equivalent from third, the top thirty floating fiat currencies. Those are these currencies: uh, thirty currencies, forty eight countries, ninety percent of global GDP, seventy three percent of global population. Right here. Why more uh, countries than currencies? Because of the euro. Because of the euro. But also, these currencies back all of the pegged currencies, all the currencies that are pegged to the euro, the dollar, the yen, uh, the South African rand. There are a few. Um, they are they are here and so that they're pegged or what's called a currency board there's 36 more currencies 67 more countries mostly in africa uh that's four percent of global gdp six percent of global populations put it all together we're at about 95 percent of global gdp from the top 30 floating currencies uh in the world bottom line on basic money is this base money or uh, what Steve Hankey, uh, famous economist, uh, likes to call state money, is not a claim. All right? It's not a claim. When you hold base money, you are holding the thing. You are holding the asset. You are holding the money. All other forms of currency or bank money, as Steve Hankey likes to say as well, are claims or IOUs. So when you hold a cash balance with a bank or a financial institution, you are a creditor. The institution is a debtor to you. This holds true for paper dollar bills, gold and silver coins, and validated Bitcoin. We'll explain this more as the presentation goes on. This is the bottom line. The moment that you deposit a dollar bill into the bank, you no longer hold the thing. You don't hold the asset. So what do you do when you have $100 that you just physically deposited and then you make a PayPal transfer? Well, you're making a transfer in a claim. The PayPal payment, the Venmo payment, whatever, the ACH, uh, the SEPA transfer, SWIFT, those were all claims done by banks among banks that was not a transaction of basic money. The only time that uh, you as a general populace can do a base money transaction is, uh, is with physical cash, physical coins, or, or with, uh, with validated Bitcoin. All right. So... Again, sort of keep hitting the nail on the head of this uh, claims or IOUs versus uh, basic money. Again, state money versus bank money. All of the central bank money is right here in the dark green. It's the same chart. Uh, it's the same $20 trillion, right? It's right here. Now, this is the rest of what we call money today in the world. We call this money. Uh, it's right here. It's lighter green. Okay, it comes to... This is top 30. Again, top 30 currencies. Um over $110 trillion in total. Uh, what is all this then in light green? This is checking accounts, savings accounts, time deposit accounts, money market mutual funds, um, all sorts of claims that uh, banks' customers have with them. It's just how it works. It's how the system scales. Um, and Immediately when you start a chart like this or people start to talk about it, they think about it, you're, you can start to get on the slippery slope of the debate of fractional reserve banking, which my co-host Fernando likes to call, you know, just stepping into quicksand. It's not what this presentation is about, but I will just say quickly, um, you know, without even commenting on Bitcoin or gold or silver or whatever, um, 
it's possible that people will trade claims right here, digitally, Venmo, PayPal, checks, whatever. Uh, it's possible that people will trade this area without even ever needing this area. Uh, I'm not saying that that's how it should be. I'm just saying that that is primarily the way that the monetary world has scaled uh, always, always. All right? And basic money is, in fact, actually more important than ever before, right? especially because of those reserves we talked about that keep getting printed. Uh, look at this percentage of all global money. Base money is, is you know, upwards towards 20%, 17 18%. So it's more, por- more important now than it was ever before, this concept of basic money. All right, now let's talk about actually measuring this, comparing it. You know, I've mentioned gold and silver. Uh, the quote from, from uh, Walter Badgett mentioned gold and silver. Let's talk about how we can actually describe this, talk about it, um, and, and compare things. And, and that's where we're going to uh, enter this concept of stock to flow. Plan B, uh, with his price prediction model, I think uh, definitely popularized this to many, many people in Bitcoin. I think it's very interesting. Uh, I just want you to know that the comments that are going to follow that I'm going to talk about with stock to flow are completely unrelated to Plan B's price prediction model. Uh, you know, I, I am personally a bit skeptical that a model can predict price of something. Uh, yet, uh, as we've seen, there have been many uh, statisticians, people that are uh, uh, have have really dug into the numbers with his stock to flow model and have not been able to falsify uh, the correlation and the co integration where basically even if some of the correlation breaks down at some point, it always seems that they come back together. They're co-integrated. It's pretty interesting. Uh, Just know that the comments that I'm saying have nothing to do with uh, the stock to flow uh, model. Also what follows is not commentary on anyone in the gold uh, nor the Bitcoin industry. Um, Stock to flow, I think, is is uh, is an interesting uh, metric, but it's not an all encompassing metric. And I just want to I want to point that out here. Okay, so number three. Uh, it really only works if you're calculating apples to apples, i.e., uh, and this is a big one here, uh, you can't remove jewelry from one stock if you don't remove it for another. And I'm alluding to what you'll see here. This is done between gold and silver. Number four, stock to flow can't tell you if a stock is declining. Uh, a lot of people like to say that stock to flow is, is simply the inverse of the inflation rate. That's actually not according to the you know, classical economic definition of what a stock to flow should imply or should mean. Uh, it's a back of the envelope type thing, but um, I'll explain that it's, it's simply that's not what it is. And it doesn't tell you things that a regular growth rate would tell you. Stock to flow is different. Uh, number five, stock to flow won't make intuitive sense for, for most comparisons. In fact, uh, it's, it's sort of a very specific thing in, in commodities and production. Number six, stock to flow does not mean doubling time. So you see a number 50, 40, 50, 60. That does not mean the years that it will take for the stock to double. Number seven, stock to flow does measure a form of hardness, okay, or, um, you know, uh, less likely to dilute, I guess. And the higher number is that form of hardness. And uh, I think Saifedean uh, did a, uh, a good justice on educating the community on, on what stock to flow means in his book. So uh, just know that it does measure a form of hardness. Uh, but then again, uh, I, even though I'm going to show you how I think all this stuff works together uh, with stock to flow, and I'm going to show you actually some new research uh, as it relates to gold, silver, and Bitcoin, I still prefer uh, generally compounding growth rates or doubling time as well, because compounding growth rates, these are things that you compare across anything, uh, population growth, uh, GDP growth, price growth, if you can trust the price data, interest rates for a mortgage. Um, you can compare growth rates better, in my opinion, up or down than this concept of, uh, of stock to flow. So these are just little, you know, some war- some words, a couple warning signs that I see when I, when I, when in my view, it's, it's used incorrectly. All right, so now we're going we're gonna to dig right into it here. This is gold, all right? Uh, in our monetary base uh, exhibit that we publish quarterly, I don't think I mentioned that, uh, we get a lot of data uh, uh, from various sources in industry. Other people do these types of curves. I've done it as well. My primary source is a gentleman named Nick Laird. He's an industry expert, uh, longtime industry expert in gold and silver, uh, blogs a lot on his website. Um, I've actually purchased this data from him. If you don't want to purchase this data or analyze it yourself, uh, <laughs> feel free to look at it here uh, and on our website, cryptovoices.com slash base money. Um, but this, what I'm, what I'm showing you right here is stuff we have not 
uh, published yet. There's some estimations, some more stuff from Nick, and I think it's quite kind of interesting. So the number that we used to compare with Bitcoin as you know basic money, which again is is the global gold supply. Uh, I just used the headline number of gold before. Now I'm going to use this number right here, this this curve right here. And what is that? That's the liquid supply of gold. Okay, so this difference is estimated approximately uh, that this is gold that's lost to industry. So it's lost to maybe dentistry. Um, it's lost to some things in electronics, uh, so and so on, so on and so forth. Uh, it's just not coming back. No one knows for sure, of course, it's not a blockchain, but this is estimated. So about 6 billion ounces of gold has been mined in all time and about five, uh, 5.2 or so is uh, the liquid supply of gold. Okay, and, and what does that liquid supply of gold include? Well, all of this in yellow is jewelry. All of this below this dark line is, is what we say is, uh, is bullion. Or, or coins and bars, that stuff that's sort of definitely been monetized uh, for, for that use case, store value, whatever, in the past as well, Defin uh, definitely media exchange or, um, or basic money, that's bullion right here. Now we have even another curve, uh, and this one I take back, usually I take these back to 1970 because that's when the gold standard ended, this one I'm taking back to 1960 uh, because it shows you an interesting change in central bank gold. So this next curve right here is gold held in central banks. All right. Now, what do we notice? First of all, um, again, this is where I, I, I just want to be clear. I have no affinity uh, towards silver versus gold. In fact, I think I'll say a lot of things that are still probably show uh, gold's hardness compared to silver um, or soundness, as some gold bugs like to say. But nonetheless, uh, I do think, again, we should be consistent with these things. So just just know my, the order of my investment affinity is Bitcoin, gold, then probably silver, and then fiat. So so that's that. But anyway, notice here, uh, gold in central bank banks actually peaked in 1965. A lot of people like to say that silver uh, you know, was completely demonetized by central banks in the 60s, uh, specifically the US, like the last big one. They don't have silver in any coins anymore in the 60s. That's true. But what people sort of ignore is that central banks were selling gold as well from that time. So this is a peak. This is the peak of gold in central banks, about 1.2 billion ounces in central banks. And then uh, it actually nadired or troughed in 2008 during the financial crisis. Uh, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, did a great job for the UK, sold all of his gold right here for like 200 bucks an ounce, sold all of the UK's gold for about 200 bucks an ounce uh, <laughs> just before the price took off and a bull run started. And then, of course, the financial crisis hit and the UK uh, definitely got a raw deal there. Uh, but other central banks sold their gold during this time. Canada sold their gold. A lot of central banks sold gold during this time. Uh, and then it did go up and it's been ticking up uh, since, since 2008. But again, a stock to flow wouldn't tell you, uh, these, these sort of, these, uh, ticks going down and then up. And it's about negative 0.1% compounded annually from the, from the peak here, negative 0.1%, even until today, even until today, it's down overall, but then it's going up now at, I think a rate of about 0.7, 0.8% from 2008. So this is why I like growth rates, just to show you these things. Again, an inverse of negative 0.1 for the back of the envelope stock to flow would be negative 1,000. It doesn't tell you anything about central bank gold. Uh, so you got to use stock to flow in a very specific manner. And then this last line is what we call transparent repositories. Um, this is also calculated by Nick, uh, compiled by Nick. Um, this is basically, it's above the, so we have the central bank line and then just this little line you can see, imagine the difference between this and the central bank gold. This is basically just private gold that's publicly, uh, excuse me, publicly published in repositories like the Perth Mint, uh, U.S. ETFs, and the Comex. Um, gold money is a famous, you know, good old Peter Schiff's Bitcoin lover. Uh, gold money, um, uh, you know, holds gold and silver for their clients. That's here, and it does not include a lot of opaque institutions like the LBMA and their uh, dealers that they work with. So that's somewhere here. Uh, other institutions, but there are there is a transparent holdings, not that much of gold here. So there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different stocks that we can measure. And these curves, I've again, I've sort of built out for the first time here. Um, and, and so we got to sort of determine how does that compare with with global fiat? How does it compare with silver? How does it compare with Bitcoin? Now, silver, same thing. 
all time silver. This is what I used to do on the website. And I, and I admitted for sure that there's some nuance here because silver, unlike gold, is much more consumed in industry and in photography and electronics and wires and buildings. Like it's, it's, it's sort of removed from industry. And the part that is removed is estimated here. Okay, so even though 53, uh, going on 54 billion ounces of silver has been mined over time, uh, it is estimated that, you know, a little over half of that is available in the form of jewelry and bullion and coins. So this is the, this is the uh, liquid, as I call the liquid supply of silver, which is bullion, coins and bars, plus jewelry. And then notice that even the bullion supply estimated, but this is, this is, at the end, at least, it's uh, relatively uh, agreed upon by most most researchers. This bullion is is you know less than ten percent of the total all time mines. So, gold, uh, excuse me, silver bars and coins, much less than gold's bullion as a percentage of the total, definitely. And I'd say as a monetary sort of indicator, uh, gold takes the cake there. And then we have the transparent repositories here. Interestingly, silver has a little bit bigger portion of the pie. Than gold, same concept as before with gold. Now we have Bitcoin. Uh, so this is the supply curve we all know and love going towards uh, 21 million coins. We're at a little over 18.2 million right now. Um, but, you know, there have been estimates. This is completely academic. I have no idea if this figure is right or not. A couple of years ago, Chainalysis said there was between three and four million that were lost, including the one million likely of Satoshi's. So just know, obviously, this curve is, is smooth just to show the difference. I think the number that I settled on was like three and a half um, difference. So, you know, you, you can just see what I'm doing there. It's, it's completely an estimate. But should that be used when we talk about stock to flow and we can talk about lost silver, lost gold, um, and then even fiat? We don't really know the loss rate of fiat, even though there definitely are boating accidents uh, with fiat uh, money as well. I've, I've read a lot of uh, past Federal Reserve reports. They're, they're estimating what the monetary base was in the 30s and 40s. They don't know. They don't know what it was. They're estimating it. Um, so anyway, I get on these little sidebars. Uh, the, that's gold, silver, and Bitcoin. Now, let's go back to this idea of stock to flow, what it actually should be, how you uh, should be rigorous about, about the calculation. So stock to flow is not simply the inverse of the inflation rate. And though, though, yes, I know often that is used and it can be used as sort of a back of the envelope calc. But this is what it should be. It was the stock over the flow. But what's the stock? Stock should always be the last year, the prior year. And it's not the gross figure. But again, this sort of hard money economist view, right, is it's a discounted figure. You discount what's actually available. Okay, you discount it. So you don't take the gross figure, but you take one of these discounts, which one we'll get into. It's not the gross, it's a discounted stock. All right, so there are the curves, same with Bitcoin. So it's the prior year, a discounted stock, and then the current year, total flow. Total flow, that's total mine production. So you don't discount the flow, you do discount the stock. You make that calculation, that's the, that's the, the rigorous, the exact stock to flow calculation that you should make. Uh, prior year of current year stock to flow. Now, I've done this. Um, and again, this is just in an effort to make it a bit more apples to apples about prior base money and then how Bitcoin might fit in there. Okay, so this is what uh, I call it the liquid stock to flow. I think that's the proper comparison. But we'll go through it here. So again, flow is the latest total gross one year of production in gold. That's about 110 million ounces. And in silver, it's about 860 million ounces literally came out of the ground last year uh it's actually 2019 for gold silver's 2018 uh, is only last year's data the last available year's data uh, 2019 is estimated but nonetheless it's going to be it's going to be close all right so the last gross full mine production here now we have all these stocks that i mentioned all these stocks one two three four one two three four different stocks let's start with the all time again all time it's the top level of the curve all time stock to flow. Let's not discount it at all. Okay. Uh, here, silver actually wins. And this is the one that I have posted before when we talk about growth rates, inflation rates, money stock growth, always with the caveat, for sure, always with the caveat that silver is more industrial than gold. Nonetheless, again, one year ago, it wasn't 6 billion ounces, but 5.9 billion ounces of gold, 52.6 billion ounces of silver one year ago. 
The stock to flow of gold would be 53. The stock to flow of silver would be 62. So in this way, silver is actually 15% better, 15% better than gold's stock to flow. But that doesn't, that's not where it ends with this stock to flow analysis for sure. And by the way, sidebar, again, why I think gold bugs would like me more than silver bugs. Again, trying to be, trying to show I have no bias one way or the other here, whether it's gold or silver. Um, a lot of people like to say silver is undervalued in price compared to gold. It's actually not at all. And you can totally see it by the, uh, by the production values. So the mining ratio, it's called the mining ratio. Uh, it's historically been around 9x. Right? So here you see the flow, it's 8x. And the all-time stock, 9x, it's completely has, is holding in recent years. And if we capitalize these amounts, uh, again, we'd have about $9 trillion in gold all-time. And you'd have about a trillion dollars in silver all-time. What's that ratio? 9x. A trillion dollars in gold versus, sorry, there's uh, $9 trillion in gold if you capitalize that, if you just multiply it by the gold price, versus a trillion dollars in silver. That's 9x. It's the same ratio. So even though the gold price may be, you know, 100x difference, right? I mean, rough, let's, roughly, let's say, uh, 1500 to $15. It's very, very rough market turmoils recently. So even though the price is 100x difference, the mining ratios are not out of whack at all. So there, there you go, gold bugs. I'm back, back in your camp there. Uh, silver is not undervalued compared to gold uh, historically. In any event, got to get back to, uh, <clears throat> I get all these sidebars always. So back to the available stock, what I call the liquid stock to flow. This is bullion plus jewelry. Okay, so you just discount whatever goes to industry, do the calculations. 5.1 billion ounces of gold remain, 26.9 billion ounces of silver stock to flow. Gold is higher, supposedly, you know, it's, it's harder. That's the stock to flow uh, uh, characteristic. It's harder than 46 x for gold. 31x here for silver. Okay, so then we go to this, this hardness factor. Silver loses here 31%. Uh, less sound, less hard. It sounds funny to say that than silver. Um, 31% less. Uh, but we, can, we we don't have to stop there. Let's let's look at bullion. Remember the bullion calc. It's this dark number here, dark number here for silver. Very small for silver. Not as small for gold relative, but you know that's that's the bullion estimate. Okay, and and I'll have links to all these estimates as well on the site. If you want to see it, let's do the bullion estimate. I, I highlighted in red just just uh, just to make it obvious. This is one that the gold bugs like to say, and this has nothing to do with people in Bitcoin, by the way. Gold bugs say this all the time against silver if if they're hardcore gold hardcore gold bugs. Um, let's look at the bullion, the actual bullion. It's estimated there's 2.3 billion ounces of gold in coins and bar form, and 3.3 billion ounces of silver in coins and bar form. So I, I'm calling it the monetary or the bullion stock to flow. It could be uh, there's that number that gold bugs likes to say. Silver is actually, it's only a stock to flow of 4X or sometimes it's quoted as 3X. I get 4X, 4X, all right? But then they're going to jump and they're going to say gold stock to flow is 53. And actually people say 60. I've never gotten a stock to flow of gold for 60 with my numbers, but whatever. Uh, so people would start with a silver at 4X and then, you know, quote, gold is being much sounder, harder at 53x stock to flow. That's not the right comparison. You got to look at how much bullion is there. You got to you gotta take out jewelry. You got to take out jewelry. And then gold there is only 21x. Still better, still better, 82% better in this, in this uh, comparison. But that's the right comparison, 4x versus 21x if you look at bullion only. All right. And then you can even do, go further. Remember that transparent repository that is the bullion that it is at least publicly stated to be held for private investment. It's not a lot. 0.1, you know, 100 million ounces of gold, a billion ounces of silver. Stock to flow is very low. 1.2x for silver, 0.x, 0.8x for gold. So silver actually won there. Silver's 46% better in this admittedly arbitrary category. So there's a lot of different ways you can do stock to flow. The point of all of this is just to say it really is important to be consistent. Uh, you should settle on this liquid stock then. And and I am indeed going to update this. I was always using the, for values and comparing Bitcoin, I was using the total with the definite caveat that silver a lot was lost to industry. Now I'm going to use these numbers, the yellow numbers on the website. So 5.1 billion ounces of gold, 
26.9 billion ounces of silver and grow these, you know, according to industry data estimates, so on and so forth as time goes on. Gold's still harder than silver as, as far as this stock to flow goes. But again, that's 46x for gold, 31x for silver. And now Bitcoin. And now Bitcoin. So remember, not lost Bitcoins a year ago. Uh, total, the total, total stock, 17.5 million Bitcoins. All right, 17.5 million Bitcoins. And we got, we're at a little over 18.2 right now. This is as of February, by the way, because we can, we can do that, obviously, with Bitcoin. This is wonderful. A uh, little over 18.2 million Bitcoins total. This is the flow in the last year. Stock to flow, 25x. And, uh, and then if we want to discount, again, pick your poison there on the discount. I'm doing, uh, I think I settled on it would be about three and a half today. But a year ago, um, a year ago, the discounted stock is estimated at 14.5. Again, my arbitrary estimates, 14.5 divided by 0.71, it's 20x, 20x. So that would be that discounted liquid available stock to flow uh, for Bitcoin. And I believe Plan B's calculations are uh, done sort of a hybrid of this. I think he removed Satoshi's uh, presumed coins, but not any others. So he would be higher than this lower than this, I believe, my understanding. Uh, but that's stock to flow. That's the proper comparison if you're going to do stock to flow. And that's how we're going to uh, do it on our website moving forward. And I would just, again, that little caveat, if you're going to say silver is 4x stock to flow, just know that the comp proper comparison of gold is 20x. It's not 53 in that category. All right. And then we got fiat. Again, this is the same chart that I showed you before the breakdown between physical and digital money. But this is by country. Uh, Two things here: the the yuan, the Chinese yuan, is actually now that they're uh, for for now they're the second largest economy in the world, uh, and and larger. Sorry, they're the second largest monetary block in the world. The yuan in, in and, and the economy of China is actually larger than the eurozone. I think uh, actually I know they're not larger than the European Union yet, but the eurozone that is countries that use the euro they're they're now larger. They passed them last year. So, so I now have the Chinese yuan sort of second. This is sort of you know GDP ranked, even though not not the size of the monetary base. So dollar, yuan, euro, the yen is huge. They love printing money and buying stocks in Japan. Again, you don't have to back this with government bonds. You can buy whatever you want, uh, as long as you know you can get away with it in the market. Uh, and then India as well. India here is a smaller monetary base than the pound, but I've added the Indian rupee here because India as well passed the United Kingdom last year. Uh, I don't know if that was light of Brexit or not. You'll see how that continues. But India is now bigger and presumably will always be bigger than the United Kingdom. So India is here. Then we have the, the, the formerly Great British Pound uh, right there. That's the top six monetary bases. And then the remaining 24 that we've done in our analysis is all here in purple. All right. So that's, that's sort of, you can see that Pareto distribution. And again, Whatever happens in the repo markets, people want to talk about that. Is, Fed, is it really quantitative easing? Is it not quantitative easing? It's, it's going to be reflected in the monetary base of the longer term. And again, on net, in the last five years, the Fed is lower. They have not printed as much money as they had five years ago. So keep that in mind. Uh, this is the printing press. This is the monetary base. This is what compares to Bitcoin. And these are the growth rates that should compare to Bitcoin as well. Not... Not, I'm going to go all the way back to an earlier slide. It may be interesting to see what growth rates we have in the broad money supply, but it just doesn't compare economically. It does not compare. It's a claim. It's different. It's an IOU. It doesn't compare to the growth rates that we have here for the monetary base. Uh, and, and just imagine that that's Bitcoin's 21 million. It's not, this is the fiat base, but these are the growth rates that are going to compare to Bitcoin and to, as I've said, the liquid the liquid stock of gold, which everybody always includes jewelry, you know, dowries in India, uh, China, around the world, like jewelry is always included for gold. So you got to include that jewelry for silver. You got to include it. And, and I will. And, and, and uh, as well, jewelry is constantly recycled back in and, and recycled into bullion uh, as well uh, into the supplies. So, so we should count jewelry. And then Bitcoin as well, uh, pick your poison. I kind of, uh, Air on the side of not counting lost coins for now, uh, simply because it's just more interesting to show uh, the total the total supply that we have, and you could argue that lost coins are a little bit different than these supplies because 
you know, you can have more that's even lost here, even though we don't think it's lost. We decide generally accept it to be lost. And again, you can have boating accidents in, uh, in fiat money as well. And like I said, uh, prior, prior reports, uh, you can, you can infer from prior reports from central banks that they're estimating, uh, the true value of the monetary base. And of course they don't know it, you know, it comes in, it's, it's reprinted, it's some of it's shredded, whatever. Uh, you don't know what a lost, lost coins and dollars are at the end of the day here either. So I kind of, that, the, that little tangent was to say, I prefer for growth rates and things to talk about this, to talk about this, uh, the growth, the gross curve. All right. So here's the, the fiat monetary base in, in country terms and currency terms. And then this is back to, to what we will continue to show when we publish the monetary base update. This is, uh, compound growth rates and doubling time, something that I believe is just a, a bit easier to understand, uh, compared to stock to flow. We'll do those as well at, at, in certain times, but again, uh, this will show you, you know, very powerful rates over long terms that tend to hold true for money. And again, one more thing I didn't say, you know, you could tell with these supplies here, I mean, these are generally accepted. Definitely the gross uh, supplies is probably the, even the strongest number, the gross, more than these sub supplies that we can find these sub stocks here. The gross supply is pretty, uh, you know, accepted. These are, you know, oil tanker economies, right? I mean, these if it's going to change, and imagine how long it took the central bank buying and selling to change. It's going to take a long time with money. This is how it goes. Uh, and I would expect nothing less for Bitcoin as far as Bitcoin adoption, as far as Bitcoin growth rate in certain institutions, um, you know, notwithstanding any sort of monopoly privileges or legality or so on and so forth. Uh, money is, is an oil tanker economy. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to move the trajectory uh, once, once it's accepted. All right. So back to the, back to the all time production again, fiat, we haven't re revised, uh, we haven't revisited this in, in uh, a couple minutes now. So back to the fiat growth, if you looked at all since 1970, so since the end of the last vestiges of a gold standard, uh, when Nixon closed the window, De Gaulle was, uh, trying to get their money back, uh, from France, by the way, you can, you can, sorry, I get on this tangent. You can see it right there. De Gaulle wants his money back right there from the U.S. <laughs> and some of it was privatized as well, of course. This is the bullion estimate. But again, leaving central banks, leaving the U.S. Uh, in the 60s, gold standard ended in 1971. From 1970 on, the fiat monetary base grew at a compound annualized rate of 12.3%. 12.3%. You can find doubling time for that. That's not has nothing to do with prices, has nothing to do with the dollar value. That's how fast euros, yen, yuan, dollars grew and then weighted, of course, by their dollar value. But it's a pretty strong number since 1969. That's a doubling every six years. So I like doubling time. I like compound growth. Again, compare that to population growth. Compare that to what you will. Compare that to prices if you want to compare it to prices. Uh, make you can make economic decisions. You can make investment decisions from that. Uh, this this gold number is actually goes back to uh, uh, industrial revolution times. It's good. You can trace this back to like the 1850s. 1.8 percent for a year, stamped, compounded, as a doubling time of every 39 years, uh, and then 1.5 percent a year for silver. It's a doubling time of every 48 years. All right, so. Uh, the, again, these are the gross terms for the growth rates. I think you, you just got to use the gross terms that the, excuse me for the growth rates. you got to use the gross terms. In my opinion, again, these are just ounces upon ounces, ounces upon ounces that are mined out of the ground, new ounces upon old ounces. These are the growth rates for gold and silver. Now, Bitcoin is interesting. Bitcoin is interesting. I always sort of check myself or think about how I can, uh, present this in an, in an easy, uh, easy informed way. Um, if you took 50 Bitcoins in January 2009 to 21 million Bitcoins in around the year 2140 when the protocol is programmed uh, to, to, to be capped, uh, I used to have a higher number for various reasons why I won't discuss. It's about this. It's about the monthly compounding to annual is about this number. So about 4.6% a year. All right, 50 Bitcoins January 2009, 21 million in 2140. It's a doubling every 16 years. But as we know, this is a very asymptotic curve. It doesn't work like that. In fact, we know that there's already 18.2 million Bitcoins left. There's only going to be 21 million ever. So from now until 2140, from now until 2140, 
uh, the monetary base of Bitcoin is only going to grow by 0.1% or double every 591 years. Now, that's the rate now. And as we know, that doubling is not going to happen because Bitcoin is going to cap uh, in 120 years from now at 21 million. So these are the classical base monies, the modern base monies, possible future base money. Uh, this is how you compare it. Uh, this is the, the landscape. And this is just a little bit of what I wanted to show you uh, today. As well, we have this. It's sort of the global relative index uh, for Bitcoin. I, I like to call it the, uh, the real Bitcoin dominance index, even though I haven't. Uh, we're working on the website to make it fancier. It's not so fancy yet. But uh, you know, Bitcoin doesn't compete against Ripple. Bitcoin competes against the dollar. Uh, it competes against gold and silver, classical base monies. Um, you know, they're true liquid supplies. And this is the growth rate based on the, the market cap of Bitcoin, all of the value of Bitcoin. Of course, we got to take it to dollars. You know, dollars are our base money today, the, you know, the sort of the basic unit of account and the basic money uh, for most people in the world. So we got to use it in dollar terms. And as of today, we're at about 30% of silver. Uh, little less than 5% of the dollar itself, the dollar's monetary base, a little less than 2% of gold, and 0.81% uh, uh, of the total fiat monetary base. Unlike fiat, gold, and silver, the supply is purely digital. We know exactly how many Bitcoins do and will exist. The supply emission is programmed, and the supply is ultimately capped. This is very different. You know, Even though we might think we know of the amount of gold and silver in the ground, we don't uh, you know, it, the supply always increases. We could mine asteroids. Uh, we, we do not know, uh, the end supply. There is no end supply. Uh, this, that's just very unique with Bitcoin. The supply is capped now Bitcoin, uh, unlike fiat, but akin to gold and silver. So go, it's related to gold and silver in this category. There's no central issuer of the basic money, no monopoly authority. It's naturally asset based in the market, demanded in the market, unmapped to any liability. You know, it just is, it just is. Number three, the supply growth uh, after the second halving specifically is low uh, single digit percentage. Uh, this is very important. You know, this is a very important fact and it's, it, it's held true for gold and silver in the past. Uh, base money is much higher for fiat today and Bitcoin specifically after the second halving uh, it just has low single digit and it's only going to go lower uh, supply growth. Number four, the supply growth is not subject to monopoly forces, but to market forces in a small asterisk. Uh, you know, no basic money, I think, however, appears immune to monopoly forces in all aspects. We'll see how that works with Bitcoin. Um, you know, you can mine in secret, but you can also be shut down for mining. Uh, you can validate in secret privately, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just see how that works. We'll see how that works with Bitcoin. So some of the, <clears throat> some of the challenges for it. Now, akin to fiat, so like fiat, but unlike gold and silver. Uh, number one, Bitcoin does not have a secondary or non-monetary use case. Okay, so a lot of people that like gold and silver, are hard money economists that don't understand Bitcoin, don't like Bitcoin, they like to say that. Peter Schiff likes to say that, right? That uh, that gold and silver at least have some non-monetary use case. Bitcoin does not. Well, I don't see it. That's uh, a big differentiator for Bitcoin. And by the way, I would not say block blockchain is not uh, not yet. It's, it's not yet a non-monetary use case. So maybe in the future, you know, insurance timestamp, you know, some registries will only rely on hashes to the Bitcoin blockchain, maybe, and maybe you can say that that's sort of a, a necessary thing that they rely on Bitcoin, but, uh, Bitcoin is just purely monetary. And I think that's actually, it's actually much better than having non-monetary use cases that can interfere with the, uh, the true value. Uh, so there's that. And then number two, gold and silver, basic money can only be fully settled in physical form. So actually, Bitcoin is more like fiat here as well. So government fiat, uh, uh, again, can be settled digitally, it can be settled remotely. Uh, gold and silver, you can certainly make those settlements, right, without moving the, co the, the coin, without moving the bars. But at the end of the day, you know, Germany requested this a few years ago from the Federal Reserve. At the end of the day, if they want to request uh their bullion uh you know you got to get it on a ship you got to put it on a tanker and you got to send it around the world so gold and silver is very different than interestingly fiat currency or bitcoin uh today so that's that category and then finally the last one how bitcoin is akin to global fiat gold and silver uh today all right 
So number one, we will never know exactly how many Bitcoins are lost, burned, or permanently removed from circulation. We'll never know that figure uh, for any of them, uh, including Bitcoin. Number two, Bitcoin can be deposited in institutions and claims, that is, uh, IOUs, uh, even credit cards or loans, can be issued against it. So again, that's what your crypto exchange account is. That's what your Kraken account is. Your Coinbase account is your Bitstamp account. Uh, there's no problem doing this for gold, silver, or dollar bills. All right. Once you deposit it, once you deposit it, you ha and you start, you know, making a wire payment or a Venmo payment or whatever. That's a claim. You've made a claim transaction. You can absolutely do that with Bitcoin. Uh, whether whether that will happen with Bitcoin, you know, we'll, we'll see. Number three. Once deposited as a claim, and this is interesting because uh, this really has ramped up, I think, recently for everyone, uh, but also just in, in the news and so on and so forth, AML5 and, and everything in Europe. But uh, this is a new thing. All right. So once deposited as a claim, these deposits are subject to restrictions such as capital controls and KYC AML. The capital controls, obviously, is not a, necessarily a new thing, but KYC AML for sure has ramped up. Uh, since 9-11, uh, and certainly in the last recent years, this is just the reality of institutions in, in the modern world. And we'll see how that works with Bitcoin, because you can absolutely KYC Bitcoin in an exchange as uh, some people, I don't know, maybe painfully find out or, or not. Number four, Bitcoins uh, can be withdrawn from institutions to your own balance sheet. Again, you can do that with gold and silver. If you take them out of gold money, for example, you could take delivery of gold and silver. You can do that with government fiat. You withdraw it from the ATM. It's on your balance sheet. Now you're holding the base money. Uh, you can absolutely do that with Bitcoin and exchanges as well. And then again, the asterisk, uh, one of the many reasons why we like Bitcoin, arguably Bitcoin's the most efficient here, you know, over time and place, no restrictions at borders, so on and so forth. So this is basic money over time. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a lot to cover, and I hope that uh, it helped you guys uh, enjoy the rest of your time in Vietnam. Uh, for any more information, uh, you can find more at cryptovoices.com uh, slash base money or base money dot world. Thank you again for listening. Uh, all the best and uh, talk to you soon. Bye.